All right, we're recording now. So welcome all uh, to our every other week Zoom Worship Lab. Um, glad you all are here and, and finding your way here uh, through our Facebook group, which uh, I'm, I'm not participating in for the summer, but Joanna and, and uh, others are, are helping to moderate that. So thank you um, for those who are doing that. Um, uh, if you are new to us, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, generally, what we do is we spend some time. I just walked through slides uh, from the church I'm serving, First Presbyterian Church in Palo Alto. As you, if you've been here for a while, you've seen our presentations begin to shift and change, and we've done a little bit more in this last one. Um, as we're learning about how to do all of this, um, you know, and and um, just be able to uh, kind of hope. What I hope to do is to hope create a sense where the Zoom worship experience has low anxiety for you so that your community has uh, lower anxiety about the whole thing. So uh, we'll walk through that. And then uh, if at the end of that, we'll just take questions and have some conversation, see where that goes. Uh, if you are speaking, uh, we always ask that you introduce your yourself, your name. If you want to do your pronouns, that'd be great. Um, where you're serving uh, and just tell us, and then you can ask questions. You can use the raise hand. Uh, feature in the participants list or you can flail your hands about and somebody will try to find you. Uh, we don't have a ton of people on here so we can kind of track folks. Um, I think that's it. So I'm going to go over and use the chat room. There's tons of uh, expertise of folks who are in this in this room right now and and hanging out. So please use the chat room. Uh, and all right, I'm going to go ahead and share. So um, First Presbyterian Church has been doing this, like many of you, since early March. We um, decided to um, uh, close our space before we went into shelter in place. We have just decided that we have completely shut down our facility uh, and uh, uh, until the end of the year, uh, as well as we decided early on not to do in-person gatherings of any sort uh, until the end of the year. We um, Internal conversations, I, mean, I think, like many folks, um, I think end of the year for us here uh, in California, in uh, Santa Clara County uh, is probably optimistic. So we're, we're really very much in leaning into what's going on um, and, and not being face to face for a while. So um, we start 930. We have about 10 to 12 people that come in as part of our leadership team. Those are greeters, deacon, um, tech deacons, our liturgists, our offering people all of those. They come in about 9.30. We spend about 15 minutes uh, doing sound checks and walking through the service. I pray. We do a bathroom break for about five, 10 minutes, and then come back in and everybody gets let in at 9.55. Uh, our organist or special music, whoever they start playing, uh, and go a little bit over 10 o'clock or so. Um, so, but this is the slide. There's, there's two things that I think um, are important. One is, is make sure you, that you um, uh, you, you make your weight room um, greeting page that you go ahead and change that. So you make it, uh, tell them anything that they need to know before they come into service. And remember, you can communicate with the folks in your waiting room. So we have a greeter who communicates with people in the waiting room starting at about 930 when we all check in. Uh, he's just kind of letting them know what's going on and, and, and how soon we're going to be until we open the, until we quote, open the doors. Um, so I would uh, highly encourage you to do that. That just alleviates a lot of the questions beforehand. And when we let people in, this is the first slide that they see, and this sits on during our entire um, kind of prelude early time. We don't do any verbal visual chatting, um, but we open up the chat room and people start interacting in the chat room. Um, so um, they see this for a while. We do welcome in announcements. Um, as we are shifting into uh, being somewhat non-geographic, we're finding we are getting more and more people uh, who are engaging more and more who are not from here. We're looking at ourselves as being as offering a theological space that um, maybe folks aren't don't have access to who are maybe geographically kind of isolated. And so we've been beginning to have some of those conversations. But we change our language a lot. As, um, around uh, welcoming people into our space. Um, all right, so then we just do announcements and I run these through these pretty quick, but I think it's important for us to do that for you to do something every week for new people. If you are trying to use this as a way to connect with new people or returning folks or whoever it might be, encouraging them to continue to connect with you electronically um, as face-to-face -face, um, aren't uh, as obviously as, um, as, uh, as readily available. Um, I do a summer check-in every summer, every congregation I've served, I've done this where I just meet up with people. And so we're in the middle of that. 
um, Bible study. If you haven't read this book, Unsettling Truths, it's um, pretty intense and hardcore and um, will change your worldview a little bit around doctrine of discovery, around uh, native peoples in your area. Um, really excellent read that if there's a little plug for it. And Mark Charles is running for president. So uh, you can always look, look him up. All right. Um, we are doing a talent show. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, and I think we'd encourage you all to begin to do this, is as you're making decisions about regathering, to begin to be plan out a little bit. So like we know we're not going to be gathering until 2021. So we're starting now kind of the things that mission work, visioning that we're we're always gonna do. We're now just kind of leaning right into all that and starting to do that. So we're doing a featuring town hall and we're doing some other stuff to get people kind of out of this constant um, overwhelmed feeling that the virus has all power over our lives. It's not that we're ignoring it, but we're kind of moving forward in the midst of it. So we encourage if there's ways you can get your congregations to do that, that would be great. A few other things that we're doing, uh, we do our breakouts at the end, really encourage new people to stay. And then I do a group of Zoom reminders um, that we standard every time. Do a service run through just so folks know what we're doing. We do not share a bulletin. Um, I, we did that from the beginning. We did not mail out bulletins uh, and that you know, I, I think that was more of my laziness than any strategic thing, uh, but we're glad that we never started that. Um, all right, so I do a centering chime, we do opening prayer, uh, we do a hymn, uh, there's a confession. One of the things we switched, it used to be that I would lead the one and our liturgist would do the many, but we've switched that uh, and uh, we're just trying to very small tweaks in what we're trying to do in terms of giving people more voice and some other pieces. So that's not a huge deal, but one of the things we do uh, our forgiveness, passing of the peace. We do a reveal at passing of the peace, which then um, lets everybody, I do it for about a minute. And folks, I just encourage people, put on gallery view, say hi, unmute yourselves, scroll through, and it's it's just chaos, but it only lasts uh, a minute. And, I have, and then I mute everybody. Um, then we do a reading. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, and then uh, in our, how we're doing things is uh, while I'm preaching or whoever's preaching, we give them a chat room question that they can engage with in the chat room. And that is increasing activity every Sunday. It's just a way um, uh, to begin to um, have a different way of interacting. Of all the things that we do, there's about a 50-50 split on whether people like it. Some people it's find it distracting to see those keep popping up on their screen. Other people really love it. So um, I like it. We're going to keep it at this point. Um, let's see. So preach, preach, preach. Now, I will say one of the things about um, uh, we, um, I, I love folks probably see these images like, oh, did Donald Trump make Bruce's sermon? He certainly did. Um, uh, one of the things that I think doing Zoom worship allows you to do is uh, if you record on a Thursday, that means that anything happens on Friday or Saturday, you don't get to preach on it and engage that in your, you know, you may follow up, but because we are live, we're able to bring in um, talking about the leadership of CT Vivian and uh, John Lewis and to begin to and use that as this launching off point around some of the stuff that we are, we began to talk about. So um, finish sermon, we do a song. Um, oh, we bring in uh, offering people. If you have not taken an opportunity to bring in folks for who will are willing to come in uh, via Zoom and have conversations. Um, if you are in um, uh, anywhere, uh, the Day Worker Center of Mountain View, especially around in Northern California, but really anywhere, if you want an amazing organization that does amazing work with day workers, Maria Marikin is uh, the executive director there. She comes in every two months or so and just gives an update. Uh, and it's lovely. And we, so we do that with all of our partners. Uh, every couple months we have, we're having them now come in as well as organizations from outside uh, our area just because we think they're doing good work. Um, and we have special music. I introduced all these things and I introduced how we do our prayers of the people. Um, so we use the raise hand, star nine if you're calling in and, and we have a tech deacon that calls on people and asks them to unmute. And then, um, uh, so that person runs that whole thing and then I close it in prayer and we go to the Lord's prayer, the prayer of Jesus. So then I do a reveal. And the rest of it is all um, is all online or all in person um, 
and not shared. All right, so I'm gonna stop share there. Um, those of you uh, that have, have been through that multiple times, you see that our graphics started to look a little different. We're shifting a few things. Um, maybe you didn't notice, I don't know. Uh, but uh, we've begun to um, uh, think, make things a little bit more streamlined for our folks who are, who are preparing our slides. All right, so let's go. Um, uh, are there any questions right off the bat? If you are new, especially, uh, you have first right of, of questioning. Uh, I see George, you got a hand up. Go for it. Yeah, hi, I'm George Lynch. I live in, uh, in Rancho Mirage, California, a member of West Hollywood United Church of Christ. Um, one of the things that we have recently discovered were that our licenses like one license did not cover for internet content and i'm wondering if others are are aware of that and kind of what they're doing about it so mm -hmm. for example our license covered for in person worship in the sanctuary but we didn't have the component that covers for streaming and um and internet use okay so just i think some with the, the we need to be thinking about right right um george you have your hand up if you want to respond to that or if there's somebody else that wants to just go ahead and answer that i'm, I'm looking uh jeff did you uh, um have a well, response to that go so for we do not Can you introduce yourself real quick oh, sorry yeah mm -hmm. jeff spencer uh he him uh niles discovery church of the ucc doc congregation in fremont california um so we do not broadcast our music we only zoom cast it and our argument is that during COVID, that is the same as being in the sanctuary. We are not putting it up on YouTube. It is only in Zoom. Um, and George's- George is shaking his head. Said, no. <laughs> um, no, it's not, I, don't, I agree. It's, I don't think, I think, no. I think Zoom cover, Zoom has to, is treated the same as streaming is my understanding. That is true. Anything that goes out, <laughs> of the sanctuary is streaming, is covered by streaming. You've just offered great discouragement to Jeffrey this morning on a Monday yeah. morning. <laughs> nice going, I'm so, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, has anybody else dealt with this? Vicki, you have your hand raised there. Go for it. Yeah, our church actually paid extra to have the, the streaming capability with the license, and that it wasn't that much. I'm thinking $250. Mm -hmm. But since we're going to do this for quite a while, we thought it was worth it. Okay. Now, at one point, uh, d didn't they, at the very beginning of this, didn't uh, all of them offer kind of it's fair game for a while? Did that stop or was that never the case? I think it was like two months. Was, okay. Okay. George? Uh, yeah. I, I, I believe it went through the end of April and then we, uh, we had had a, a CCLI streaming license. Oh, by the way, I'm George Reisner, Tecumseh, Michigan, First Presbyterian Church. Um, and when the uh, and one license offered the free for a couple of months and then we uh, signed up for it and it wasn't we have a, a small congregation I think it was like ninety dollars for the year. Mm -hmm. so well, that's that's probably bad. good for you to check out. I mean, I'm fortunate. I have a choir director that I a music person. That I should probably my guess is that they did not check that figure that out. So um, yeah, probably everybody should. We want to pay our musicians and our artists and all that kind of thing. So you should probably go check that out to make sure that folks are being compensated for their work and their creativity. All right. I see. A, a George, did you have a different question? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, go for it. We're in the process of uh, upgrading our internet so that we can do uh, streaming. Well, a live, well, doing Zoom first just from the sanctuary with a few people and then eventually work on the hybrid um, worship. And I was just wondering what sort of uh, upload speeds are, do people have that are actually, that it's actually working? Um, I know I, I looked at the, the um, what was it, live, live streaming for the long haul and he suggested a minimum of 10 megabits per second. But I just, just wonder oh, if anybody else had. Uh, you, you gotta have more than, I, I can't imagine you working with that. <laughs> I, I would, uh, yeah, you're going to need, I would get whatever you, the fastest you can have and then plug in. And plug in. Ethernet. Yeah. The plug in, the plug in as well. I mean, we're, so in San Francisco, you can get fiber in where I am now in Palo Alto, you can't, and they never will because the density is not the same. 
So we have the highest, I think WARS is now up to 1100. So, uh, and it, it averages around 60, 600 to 800. Um, and it, and it works fine, especially if you're hosting. I mean, I think you want to have as much speed as you can, um, as, as possible. So it's, it's worth the expense right now. This is one speed is one thing I would not encourage con congregations to cheap out on. I mean, I think that, um, whatever um, the highest you can get and be faithful with your stewardship is what I would get. Um, so I don't know what they're offering for business, but um, it's definitely worth the expense and less. And because if you start having internet issues that just compounds anything else other people are having, then that'll just make the whole experience frustrating. That'd be, that, that'd be my experience. Go ahead. Somebody was going to say something. Uh, Bruce, Kristen Granberg, New York mm -hmm. City. Um, what we found is that we need to be plugged in with uh, the Wi-Fi, but also our tech person, our main tech person, has to have good Wi-Fi and, and plugged in well, who's running the slides and stuff. So, because with the videos coming through, that has to also be strong enough. So just keep that in mind yeah. in terms of a balance. Whoever, whoever you're using that is going to generate um, content going out needs to have very strong internet access. Now, not everybody does. It's you know, one of the digital divide questions, but um, for any leadership, have strong internet. Because I think that is, that is avoidable frustration. Um, so just to make sure that you, you get as high as you can. All right, uh, George, were you going to follow up and then I'm going to move on to, I'll go to looking for hands raised, but yeah, I've been running the slideshow and just upgraded and to a higher to fiber here at home, oh, but it, it's, only a, it's only a 20 megabit per second upload and we haven't had any problems with it, so. Really? That's awesome. I, yeah, that would freak me out if I saw 20 on mine, on my speed test. <laughs> but I don't know if that's just our area or, or what, but that's, that's good. All right, Ray, you had your hand up? Go I'm for in it. Alexandria, Virginia, and I hadn't checked what my church has, but this is a good point. I know at my home, it's 10 megabit megabit that's very common for comcast service people get confused by the download speeds which are huge on mine it's over 200 megabit but the upload is very constrained and that's something i know i'm going to check with my church on uh to make sure they're aware of that right right and it's it's pretty low in this area i but yeah 10 10 is usually the low end but well definitely. and you can actually in some places you can split your band and move uh, and switch them around so that you can get a higher upload if you if you want. Um, but that's that is that it depends on on your yeah, service. This right. area is, yeah, that's something we got to check on. The business accounts might be a little different. Yeah, yeah, they start to get a little pricey too. So, all right, um, other questions, thoughts, as you think as are going on um, um, around what you're doing, uh, anything you're bumping into, things you're planning uh, that anybody has any co thoughts, comments about. Questions for me or anything? Everybody's pros now. Sally, go for it. So I don't think anybody's run into this problem, but I but Can you quickly introduce yourself and where you're serving? Yes, sure. sure. I'm Sally Newhall, I'm a Presbyterian minister in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, and we do live Zoom, we don't record, uh, just to feed that in. Um, but I was trying to share um, a video from the Big God, Big Questions curriculum. It's like a three minute video and I had it on a CD plugged into my computer and I wanted to share and it was running on my computer. But as soon as I used the share screen, the video went gray. And I was wondering if anybody else had run into that kind of problem. I ended up going back to the PCUSA store and paying for the download it works uh, if after I've downloaded it, but it didn't work from the CD player. Mm. Anyone? Oh, <laughs> Sometimes we just don't have the answer, which is. I tried like ten times. Like life. I'm not spend any more money, but. Mm. Yeah, my guess. My guess is there might be some kind of protection on it, or um, which is which is odd. I, I don't. I don't know. I've never. I mean, I've never tried to play a CD through my computer and then try to stream. So I think that may be just something that it might be unique to what you're trying to do. My, so. my guess is that there, there is some type of copyright protection on it, which also would you might be able to try to rip it 
to make a copy, but the copy would probably be gray. There's probably something that they've yeah. put into that. Yeah, that's I good. Just oh. want to the music conversation. Um, I actually got a lawyer's legal opinion that as long as we're live streaming the Zoom and did not record or put it on Facebook or YouTube, that we didn't need to have um, any copyright, hmm. extra copyright coverage. Um, hmm. We pay for the basic one license, but I'm not paying for streaming. So it's just feedback for you all. Hmm. I mean, right, there is a certain level of, is anybody really gonna go after people at this point? I mean, I think practically not. It's just a matter of, if you can afford it, and you, I, I, think, I, I think I'm always in that place that if you can afford to pay for your copyright, and it's not an overly taxing burden on a congregation, you should probably do it just so that folks are getting compensated for their work um, as much as possible. But, you know, it, and again, it does vary from place to place. Uh, Kathy, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Oh, uh, you're still muted. There, oh, there you go. go. Yep. Hi. Um, this is Kathy Keener. I'm in Seattle. She, hers, hers. Um, and I'm at Madrona Grace Presbyterian Church here. Um, we have a, a piece where we've had a long standing um, on Zoom scheduled time for, and, and address for our worship service. It was a recurring thing that we put in place before any of the passwords or <laughs> waiting room were required. And it suddenly disappeared off my list of meetings available. And the surprising piece is that the code still works to open the meeting, even though it's no longer on the list. Um, my guess is that they're trying to get us to stop using it. Um, but for now, at least, it's still functioning properly, and it's been a couple weeks I've noticed that it isn't on my list anymore. Anybody have any feedback or thoughts about that? Yeah, so you are soon going to be forced into waiting rooms or passwords, I believe is the new update, but passwords and waiting rooms. So um, I would start making that transition. We've started making that transition for all of our meetings to go. We, are, we have a three-step process. We now schedule it, password embedded, and waiting room. And then um, we go, we take that link and go to bit.ly. We make a shortened link. And then that's the, the one that we share out publicly so that you're not um, anything that's scouring the internets and your website from Zoom links, uh, they won't pick it up. So, um, but I would start transitioning everybody over to getting used to being in a waiting room, not just for your congregation, but that's gonna be the nature of Zoom going forward. If you've noticed, there are more and more waiting rooms that people are using. Um, so, I mean, it probably still will work. Um, I, I don't trust Zoom enough to like that it's gonna all, like it's just gonna work every Sunday. So, I mean, that would be, that would make me really nervous uh, just to not see it and be able to adjust it and all that. I would be proactive and start getting people going, but that, that's just my personality. Um, other thoughts, folks have experienced things like that. Um, especially if it's not showing up um, and still works. Anybody else? Well, I, I, I want to just quickly toss in that for the last two weeks in the e-blast I sent out, I've said, this is the link. And if that doesn't work, <laughs> then you have to go to this. Oh, good. And then you have to do it. So that's been Did, in the back up there. But I do people, have to move the other were, one up. Were people able to get into the same meeting? Oh, yeah. Okay. What, one, yeah. Of the, one of the ways I've been addressing that is telling people it's security issues. So we have to change the address just for security and everybody goes along with it without, so they understand that part. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. make sure that you change your waiting room messaging because so if you were to um, look at our church waiting room, it says, um, uh, if this is not worship, please be patient, somebody will let you in. And then we have a bunch of our worship ones because you can only have one waiting room messaging out. It, it's not per meeting, so you can't change it per meeting. It's, you just have to, so find your most generic way to let people know that they might be in waiting room for a meeting or they might be in a waiting room for, for worship. So we've clarified that to make sure that um, folks know when they get in. Because when we didn't do that, we had people show up for a meeting and then I get these texts saying, I'm at the worship meeting. The waiting room says it's worship. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just the same. So we learned that by having people not understand what a waiting room is. 
So that'd be one another change to start making for folks. Um, Sally, go for it. So um, I'm confused because I thought they came coming in Zoom. You would have you had to either use a password or have a waiting room. And if you use the long link, it's got the password embedded. So um, which I right. so, so we we so there's a couple of things we do security wise, right? We we don't share that link out actually anywhere even with a bitly if we any when we share it out to people publicly um, like sending it through an email or something we we only use bitly links we don't share out that long link anywhere just because emails we know get forwarded that kind of stuff um, the only ones that you'll see on our website are ones that are registration based now we're transitioning all of our things to registration based we've been very fortunate and we have not been zoom bombed um, but i you know those of you that have been, um, it is not a good experience for your people. Um, and it really, it, beyond what they see, it, it shakes kind of the nature of the gathering itself. So um, I would start really moving over um, and not publishing any direct links to any meetings anywhere. Um, Vicki, you have your hand raised, go for it. Um, we've uh, had four Zoom memorials so far. And what we do is anyone is invited, they come in, we share stories about the person we've lost and usually family members of that person have come to listen to what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And it's been great. Um, we just lost our organist yesterday. Oh and my goodness. So I'm just wondering if you have had any experience with things that work well for you in these mm. kinds of meetings. I'm so sorry, that is, you know, I don't know about your congregations, but we're hearing about more and more people. The circle of our congregation has been very well behaved, but the circles of people being impacted, just not only being uh, not dying, but also being in the hospital are just increasing. So I'm sorry to hear about that for your community, uh, Vicki. Um, so I've done, I've only done one um, uh, Zoom memorial, but others, do you have any thoughts about anything that you've done that have helped those Zoom memorials be um, helpful. I've, I've found, I will say that for me, how well we lead, like just like in worship, how well you lead people through those experiences in person or online, that's a huge part of what is going on. So the more anxiety and questions about what's happening next and all those kind of things that you can alleviate and take on as part of your role, that's, I think that's the most important part that folks know like just like a wedding or a funeral or anything where the family doesn't have to worry about anything, but being there, listening, the speakers when they need to speak and you help to, to, to move that service along. And in fact, I think there's even more, Zoom makes it a little easier in some ways, like to ask if people wanna speak, if you have opening it up to be able to moderate people. And you know, before you'd have to kind of make the step towards folks and remind them that they need to stop talking. Now you can just be like, okay, thank you. And you can hit the mute button and you find out pastoral ways to begin to do that as well um, in Zoom. Um, but others. A service or just a meeting? Like people just come and talk or do you think a service would be helpful? So we, we did it. Um, we found that, um, that the best part about Zoom is people seeing each other's faces that they weren't able to do. So we don't do any webinar things uh, at all for kind of gatherings that we want to have have a pastoral kind of sense to it. So we would do a full meeting. Um, and this is where it's really important. I was just sharing before this. Um, I don't think there I have any San Jose Presbytery colleagues in this meeting, but uh, we just had a Presbytery meeting on Saturday for those non Presbyterians are judicatory. And it's about 70 churches. I don't, I don't know. It was awful in many ways because um, we didn't think about how to use Zoom well. The content was going to be tough, but the Zoom piece. And the thing that I think every meeting, and I would say memorial, you need to have Zoom, a Zoom deacon, a tech deacon that's helping you so that you're not also managing chat room, all this other stuff. And you just get to lead worship. You get to lead whatever you're doing. Um, I would say, especially in a memorial service, to make sure that you have a tech deacon who you've communicated with and is going to communicate back to you and all that. I would say that's the most one of the most important parts to allow you to lead that service through 
and watch the screen and all those kind of things. So, but others who have done Zoom uh, uh, memorials, do you have any um, council thoughts, um, you know, mistakes that you made that are, are, would be helpful to, to, to share? Not seeing anybody that's done any, you know? Lucky you. I know. <laughs> We've, we've had multiple people tell us that they don't want to do it. We, we have had, so we've had four people die during this time, two COVID related and two just kind of the end of their life. And all of them have said, we, we, would, we would rather just wait. And uh, these are folks who are much, much older and I think we're okay with waiting. And so we're, so we did have folks who just not wanted to do it. Um, I so. So Bruce, Kristen, Granberg again. Yep. Yeah, thankfully in New York, our, our deaths have really dropped. Um, but yeah, I've done a couple of Zoom and basically it's just the same thing. I lead it as I lead worship and work with the folks as I would work with them normally. And everyone's, as long as, as you say, the leadership, I just stay calm. I have found though, that the services go longer, particularly when it's more family directed because they're starting to do family greetings and I think that's something to think about as you set it up. Mm -hmm. So I've actually had two go two hours when they would have been about 45 minutes in the sanctuary because of that distance, people who wouldn't have come normally. So just to think about that in terms of an overall um, reflection. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, because those family members haven't seen each other as well. So yeah, um, I see Woody, your hand is up. Go for it. Introduce yourself. And Hi. Um I'm Woody Collins. I'm from Indianapolis of Faith Presbyterian Church, and and we had one uh, service for our pastor, who uh, her mother was also a member of the church, and she passed away, and it went really well. Uh, we did a practice session the Friday before, uh, and then we did it on Saturday, and it went really well. You know, just uh, like you say, having the tech deacons to kind of monitor everything and know the order of service and when different people were going to come in, it uh, made it a lot better and it went went off without a hit. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, practice, 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 right? I mean, that like any other services, you all are starting to get used to doing this, but even so, um, making sure that we continue to practice. Thanks, buddy. All right, other, other um, responses to that, or uh, we can even shift, shift topics. Go ahead, Kathy. Well, actually, I was gonna add on to that. This is Kathy in Seattle. Um, we've had a visitation that was run by a Filipino family where they had created a big portrait of mother surrounded by flowers and things and had a viewing of sorts oh, for wow. all the relatives around the world, which wow. was kind of an interesting piece. Um, I was afraid it was going to be an open casket because I really wasn't sure what they were talking about. Um, and they had me do a prayer at the beginning of it. And then the family did some pictures and then they just had their uh, picture of mama up there um, for everybody to look at. That was an interesting piece. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm finding is that perfection is starting to enter into funerals similar to weddings. Um, that we have to have the perfect music done in the perfect way, mm. that we have to make sure all the right speakers are there and we have to seek out videos from long lost cousin Lucy who normally wouldn't have been involved at all. And um, it, it's becoming, uh, we'll delay this until we get it right and then we'll have the memorial service. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a different um, than what would have been before where wed weddings required perfection and funerals were good enough. Right. Funerals, you just got together. You just, yeah, yeah. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Kevin. Whoever wants to come. Uh, um, uh, George, go for it. Your hands up. Yeah, this is a, a different topic, but mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we have found that uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of questions from, from parishioners as well as some people who cannot attend just because of technology cannot attend zoom worship but has keep saying you know when are you going to open the church when you go open the church so our response has been we're writing we're writing our plan right now realistically it's going to be a long time I and mean, probably right. not until 2021 before we even 
think about reopening, but at least we're having a plan in place with phases and gating criteria. So I'm just curious, are other people at that, at that point as well? Uh, I certainly have some thoughts, but anybody else want to respond to what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, this is um, Sandra. I'm in Sitka, Alaska. Yeah, we oh. just wrote our plan um, this week with a small committee, and uh, we're going to, we, we actually borrowed it from Faith Lutheran Church in I don't know where, but it was a, <laughs> But it was a great plan and I found it online. And so we just sort of plugged in our stuff and and edited it. We're gonna get it, I hope, approved um, at a special council meeting this week and send it out to people. But it's looking at, you know, staying closed until at least more, uh, sorry, Labor Day and then rethinking and how we move to phase to phase. But yeah, that's where we're at right now is is writing the plan. Great, thank you, thank you. Liberating other people when they put it online. I think it's you put your plans online and they're fair game. So good on the Lutherans for offering something good there. Um, I will say, George, we, um, be, by choosing clearly to not open uh, anything or not gather until 2021, uh, that's bought us time to people have not expected a plan. So that that has allowed us to be like, when we get to, because part of it is we also know that things are changing, you know, week to week. Um, that, so what we've been kind of, our thing has been, when we get to October, November, we'll, we'll begin to think, we'll at least ask the question again, because most of our folks know that it's not gonna be, and, and where you are, George, I mean, yeah, you're George is yeah, in Southern we're, California. We're, we're at, yeah, we're we're at the heart. Yeah, so we're ground zero. Yeah, Californians, we can't don't get to go anywhere at, for a while because nobody is going to let us in anywhere. So, um, um, I so what we've what I've told our worship committee. So we have some worship folks who are <coughs> so used to just doing, 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 which often is great. In this case, they're like, well, let's plan our hybrid process. What's that going to look like? What do we need to do? What cameras do we need to get? And I'm like. Let's not actually, and I've really had to push them. So let's think about what we're going to do for Advent. Let's plan out what Advent's going to, and, and be more like what worship committees should be doing. And then I, I've kind of just said, it doesn't make any sense for us to start looking at this technological stuff until we really think we're a few months out from doing it. Because people are like, well, let's get rid of the pews now. And I'm like, well, one, I don't want to start a fight that's not worth starting right now. So we're being, I've been very clear that we're not putting together a plan until we know we're a few weeks out. Now, what people do know is that we've said once a few weeks, once we're a few months out, we will be doing it. So that in some ways is a plan. We've kind of given them that marker, but we've not done anything official. All the plans I've seen seem exhausting to me, um, just in terms of getting back together. And I don't want to work that hard. And I've told them that I'm 75%. And if you want me to spend 15 or 20 of my hours working on getting that arranged, that's fine. Um, the other piece I would say is that um, um, we've, we've really used this opportunity and flipped it to begin to say, this gives us some downtime to think about who we are as a church. And then they're not as eager about getting back together. It's like, who are we going to be? Who are we? So my preaching topics have changed away from how do we survive this time? to, all right, here we go. We're now in this, who are we gonna be? So I've tried to shift our theological conversations uh, to be more proactive about where we're headed. Uh, so that, so those subtle kind of strategic changes I've tried to do, but no, no plan. The, oh, I was gonna say the one thing that we did do have, um, we did not start, Presbyterians uh, put out guidance, I don't know if other denominations did, that at the very beginning that said, start a pandemic task force. And we did not, and I wish we had, because nobody thought, I mean, we didn't really think we would be doing this for a year plus, right? And so our session handled all of that, and we'd finally decided things had started to happen to us with our tenants and other things that session like we're spending time. So we started our pandemic team about a month ago with trusted, trusted people, and they made the decisions for us now. And so that group is going to be the one that is going to decide when we start having official conversations about regathering. And that has taken that whole thing off of sessions plate and they have rejoiced in not having to talk about 
coronavirus reopening at every session meeting. Our pandemic team, we have a health worker who works at Stanford. We have a person that's really, really organized and we have a person from personnel. So just three people and it's been lovely. So if you haven't done that, think about a pandemic team that can offload some of these conversations for you. All right, seeing some hands. I'm gonna go Sally and then George and then Polly. So we're in a different place in New Hampshire. Again, I'm in Nashua, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, and New England, things have kind of settled down. For I think you're the only ones that are green or whatever it is, right? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> exciting. And, we, and we're allowed to cross borders. I'm only a, a mile from the Massachusetts border. Uh, we just lost your sound, Sally. Oh, sorry. I know, okay. I know yep. we have to, drive, have to quarantine 14 days after driving one mile into Massachusetts. So, um, uh, so that's great, but it means that people are chomping at the bit to get back in. And mm -hmm. but I'm in my 70s. I have no desire absolutely to get back in. It's so we started, the session started a task force to discuss it. They're focusing on what needs to happen in the building, um, which I hoped would keep them busy, but not busy enough. So, <laughs> so some people want to open up again in September. And, and, um, and my message to them is that'll be fine, but I'm not going to be in the sanctuary. So one of them said... <laughs> zoom in and we'll project you on the front mm -hmm. wall so that's kind of where we are is um trying to balance all these things that's, together so you're you're gonna be i think that's great my my uh my mom is in her 70s and is pastoring still and she's told their congregation you can show up but i'm not going to be there and if any of you know my mother it was not probably said that kindly so um if it and and they're like okay so i think part of the the I mean, I wish they wouldn't gather, obviously, but um, you're going to be in that first stage of what does hybrid look like if they're really going to force this and your community is safe enough and all those things. Um, so that projecting, you might be the one of the first folks that are going to begin to project. The other piece is if you're going to move there, giving options to other people who don't want to be there in person. And so you're going to have to build out two teams now, um, a tech team, and, and an in-person. Um, so again, ideally we're not gathering, but if their community, that's where they're moving, you have, you're have you gonna be ahead of the game a little bit. So it'd be interesting to know how that's gonna work for you. But, um, Bruce, can you I just say that our plan, um, it's not just focused on, on opening for worship, but it's uh -huh. focused on every other thing. Like we have a sack lunch program. So we, we're in mm -hmm. phase one, what we're calling it, which is no, no worship in person. It's, you wow. know, online worship only, but we had to have something that would say, okay, if somebody needs to actually go into the, to the yes. sanctuary on an extraordinary circumstance, how are we going to plan for that? Or so, a sack lunch program for the home. I would say if you don't have a task force, a pandemic task force, start it now. Cause that's what ours did. Cause we, we do. Have, we, and we, oh, you know, okay. Yeah. So we've, we've made plans for like our homeless shelter that, that, that's yes. on church and, and just, we have actually gone, it feels really draconian to all of our folks because we've had to backtrack. And then we just said, if there are exceptions, you just need to tell the pandemic team and they'll let you know, but that's so similar. We've, we've kind of said, here's tenants, here's our ministry outreach things. Here's our, all of these things. Uh, but, but knowing that we're not meeting until 2021 has taken that whole conversation off the table. Yeah and allowed us to do other things. So that's, that's good. Um, let me go back, uh, George, and then Polly. Go for it, George. Yeah, the other George. It's oh, confusing. George Reasoner. Sorry, George Reasoner. Yeah, sorry. George R. Uh, yes, we have started, uh, we started our, what did we call it? Opening the building task force uh, back at the end of May. But we have, I'm, what we've been doing so far is just setting out, um, what are the benchmarks we need to be able to do these next steps and what do we think those steps should be? But right now we have no real timelines associated with that other than, there's another thing, um, there are two people who are planning to have weddings in August in the sanctuary. Um, and right now um, we were at a limit of 50 people in a gathering but then our county started to uh, have some extra cases and they've now got it back to 10 people in a gathering. So we're sort of telling people who are having weddings, 
you, you can tr go ahead, but you're going to be limited by whatever the county health department says is, is, um, um, thank you, uh, George R. Paul, you had wanted to say something. Go for it. Uh, like I, I'm Polly Moore from uh, College Heights UCC in San Mateo, California, and uh, our it's a very small church, so Sunday morning is you know 25 or 30, and like you, pressure is uh, is building up to get back together again. So rather than argue about Sunday morning, we did something different. Saturday we had a <laughs> garden party, completely outdoors, bring your own food and drink, stay far apart, wear your masks, and wave at each other, and just, you know, be in person. And then it, there was a Zoom meeting at the same time, so I took my laptop and surprisingly got signal outside. So like this little avatar Zoom walked around and said uh, people could say hi to the ones who were still at home. Um, the feeling I got Sunday morning was that went a long way toward mm. camping down the conversation about when are we going to get back for worship. Right. And I could imagine in when it builds up again in another couple of months, we'll just have another outdoor event. Right. And it it just it just calms things down. It's a great that's a great idea. Polly is in San Mateo County, where it's the one county surrounded by all of our other counties <laughs> that are not on the watch list right now. So <laughs> right. Everybody's going to San Mateo to get their hair cut from what I'm saying, because you can Crazy. still do that there. Yeah, it's wild. Thank you, Polly. Um, I, I thought I saw another, another hand come up somewhere else. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Other thoughts about questions as we are getting to the end a little bit? Oh, oh good. Brenda, go for it. Sandy did... Uh, that's that's a really or that was a really helpful um, piece. I I am interim pastor in a UCC church, a very uh, a church about half the size of yours. We have um, fifteen to twenty people in a regular worship service, average age eighty, mm. and um, so getting people to use Zoom means um, we have a majority calling in on phone, mm -hmm. and registration is just not even going to be an right. option for us ever. Yep. Um, what I'm watching is um, in Chicago area, we are being allowed to open back up, but that needs to go the other direction because our numbers are, are um, moving upwards again. On the other hand, I have a congregation where we've lost two members non-COVID related um, since pandemic started and people are now afraid they're never going to see each other in the flesh again. Yeah. I have a hard time telling them that they can't um, be in contact with each other when they are really at that kind of a place. So the outdoor garden party might work for us. They are starting to think about um, coming back in person. You know, we're not going to have more than 15 in worship anyway. So I know of two congregations in Chicago that are doing outdoor chalked circles so yeah. some of it is is yeah. really making sure, and these are multi-generation and they've yeah. now done it three services in a row. But I guess one of the issues they're gonna have is outdoor when you it starts getting hot, like it's gonna be awful. But they've started and, and what they've done in the small community like yourselves is they've just, but they've done like, they're being super, super strict. I mean, they chalk the circles are very clear. Everybody, you need to be in your circle um, and, get all that so I, I think there are ways to do that as long yeah. as Chicago is still safe enough for people to go out I mean that my biggest my biggest fear is right is it's not just going to church but how to then like the all the other pieces but that mortality question I think all of us are probably having that with our older folks is that is seeping greatly into people's it's minds yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're fortunate. About half of our older folks over 70 are in some kind of retirement community out here. That's popular out here. And they're not allowed out. Like, I don't even have to have that conversation because their buildings are not letting them out. But then it's our other folks who are on their own still. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I think. Thank you, Brent. I mean, that mortality question is, I'm sure, for a lot of our people, you've been having that. Yeah. It's very big. I'm also in a congregation. I've never served a congregation that is so resistant to talking about theology before. 
Um, and mm -hmm. so talking about any kind of pastoral um, care for each other or, or sense of, um, of God's eternal care for us is not going very far mm -hmm. in terms of, of their conversations. But we have recently learned that we can push really hard on our insurance boards. And, um, and they will listen to what our insurance board says they will and will not cover from the church. So that at least gives us yeah. a little bit of an in. Thank Fascinating you. to watch. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Brenda. And blessings on the work you're doing. So uh, Marty, go for it. So Marty, Susie from Savannah, Georgia. Um, our presbytery has about 34 churches and some of them are very rural where they have tiny congregations like you all have been speaking on, you know, maybe 25, 30 people, but their sanctuaries are large enough. And Georgia, of course, is, you know, in its own <laughs> embroiled battlefield. Oh my goodness, watching Georgia is Ooh, fascinating. Right it's now. exciting, is it not? Um, yeah, I guess yeah, that's so, one <laughs> So a lot of our pastors are feeling a lot of pressure to open up because churches across the street or down the road are, are doing so. And so um, they have um, done various things where they're, you know, instituting mass and, and spacing out and they're able to do that as, as best they can. Other churches that are um, closer to the city um, have done a couple different things. They're doing some evening vespers and they're doing much like you were talking about Bruce with the, the chalk drawings. They mark their parking lot and families bring their little um, camp chairs, plop down there, stay in their little area. They have an outside Vesper service. And then that's satisfying um, the ability to be able to see each other. Um, and another church has done um, more like a drive-in. So they have a radio um, that they're projecting out to a radio station. So the cars pull up, they all stay in their car, they wave at each other, they beat. They even drive through and drop their offerings in a basket. <laughs> um, so lots of different things to try and satisfy um, seeing each other. Um, our youth, our church is, is month to month. The task force goes and says the numbers are too high and then they put it off for another month, which is fantastic. Um, but the, um, the youth, uh, you know, the, especially the graduating seniors who didn't get to have their graduation ceremonies, et cetera, et cetera. We've done some outside things for them. So um, congregation members came and parked their cars in the parking lot. And then the youth in the Memorial Garden, which is an outside area, went to different stations and p just simply picked up different things that were, one was for their baptism, one was when, the, you know, just memory and sighting items. And then they walked a little parade in between the cars, everybody beeped uh, at them. And so they had that little activity outside. So it seemed to help, like you're saying, with that need to be together. Yeah, thank you, Marty. There is so much, I'm, like I haven't done actual youth ministry in, in uh, a very, very long time, but there are so many creative things that our youth workers are, are doing. I'm just finding it fascinating to see the way that folks have adapted uh, to get some kids off screens um, and to do some still some creative kinds of things. So um, I, I think it's just fascinating. So thank you, Marty, for offering some of those. Lovely. Awesome. Um, anybody else want to just offer any other things that uh, you maybe may have um, that have sparked your interest uh, a little bit? Joanna, you're in there in the chat room. Do you want to offer some of the stuff that you've um, been doing? Sure. Um, we've done a couple of outdoor gatherings that are intergenerational. And like tell us again where you are. Oh, yep. University Press in Rochester Hills, Michigan. So w listening to you all struggle, we have the, um, we have a good portion of our congregation, first of all, who thinks we don't have to follow the governor's orders anyway, because, you know, <laughs> churches are exempt. Just in general, and, we're not doing it. <laughs> and the three largest non-denominationals have gone back to worship. And so um, we're a suburb of Detroit, which means like that's the thing to do. So we struggle with that piece, yeah. but we've found a place of doing gatherings for social time, including a tailgate, no alcohol slash what we're now going to call picnic because folks thought tailgate meant alcohol when we're a non-alcohol church. Um, and we've had 40 or 50 people come to those things intergenerationally. Um, sit in your car, we've made it very clear, you know, wear your mask kind of thing, except to eat. 
Uh, we've done things like find the dairy farms that are that make ice cream with our youth group. We've done um, youth online with other churches that are around us. Um, so we're finding ways to keep ourselves, especially in youth ministry, like trivia nights and <laughs> whatever else we can come up with, <laughs> frisbee at a distance and um, frisbee golf and all that kind of stuff. So awesome things that are just keeping people like really engaged and busy. Great. Thank you. I, I'd say the two creative things that I've heard, uh, Addie Domsky, who's the director of youth ministry at Sunnyvale Press, does uh, boba with the with Addie. And so she has boba delivered to their house. And then she has it at her place. And they just she just does one on one conversations while they're drinking their boba, like they would do normally. And then she's doing yoga with them as well. So she started a, a yoga with the youth uh, that has been pretty successful. Um, so Again, so many creative things out there. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And we're doing like even study stuff. So my youth group chose to read White Fragility. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an interesting mix because we were a predominantly white congregation, meaning like 99%. But my youth group has two kids who are halves and then <laughs> one that is all... Um, person of color and then like three that are all white so it's an interesting mix of people and mm -hmm. conversations so that's been dynamic and intriguing yep. too awesome as youth groups often are more diverse than the larger congregations lovely exactly. thank you for thank you for uh joining your long-term work with our young people and if you don't know <laughs> joanna joanna has been doing this for a long time <laughs> so uh all right other things before we kind of head out all right, you all. Um, I did post, um, you can always, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, all these, I did post the last two. I'll make sure I do this one faster than I did before. Um, and I'm still not back on Facebook till the end of August. So, and again, um, as, as I'm telling every pastor, all pastors I meet with, take some time off, figure out a way to really, really, uh, last, last week I took a week off, stayed home. I canceled or rescheduled every Zoom meeting. I had one Zoom meeting for an entire week and it was a family one. And the amount of just energy that I didn't expend, I took naps when I wanted. I have about 30 pictures I'm supposed to hang in our new place. I hung one, um, barely did any chores. I cleaned, I, and then I made sourdough bread because that's the hipster thing to do apparently. So um, anyway, uh, blessings on you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, I will see you in two weeks. All right. Take care. Have a great week.